past five months have been overwhelming, and I'm sure that life is gonna continue to be overwhelming for the foreseeable future. Looking back now at when all of the restrictions began, it just seems unreal to me how normal everything was until it just suddenly wasn't. It was almost as if like someone had flipped a switch and everything was different. 75 million Americans now told to stay home. Today, the US government extended the federal tax deadline 90 days. Hospitals are running out of space and first responders are running out of supplies. The 2020 Summer Olympics, now the latest major sports cancellation caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. The U.S. unemployment rate reached 14.7% in April. That is the highest it's been since the Great Depression. My school, the Aaron Copeland School of Music at CUNY Queens College closed on March 11th, 2020. Right when it happened, we were told that the campus would remain open, the music building would remain open. So we would still have access to the practice rooms and the libraries and other resources that we would otherwise have for in-person classes. That night, there was an emergency town hall type of meeting in the atrium where the head of the music school basically came out and said like, all right, here is what's happening immediately right now. And we don't don't really know what's gonna happen in the future. All classes were canceled for about a week while we transitioned to online learning. All of the performances that were scheduled for that week were just immediately canceled. And then everything else just kind of got thrown into limbo. Though at that moment, there was hope that we would be back before the semester ended. There was even hope that we would get to continue to have our private lessons in person while we were doing distance learning because it's just, you know, a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. Even still, before I left the building that night, I went to my locker and I just, I took everything out just in case. When I walked out of the building that night, I had a really, really bad feeling that I wasn't going to be back there for a while, and it turns out I was right. March 11th. 2020 at the Aaron Copeland School of Music, doing yeah. classes as one does. Had our last formal rehearsal in the morning for my vocal ensemble. Like during free hours, saw all the professors just kind of like looming around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> doing something was sus. And then it wasn't until after I got out of history where I saw like the tweet from Cuomo. Right, like, it was a tweet. By the way, guys. <laughs> <sighs> There was the official CUNY email went out later that night. The first that anybody heard was a tweet because there was so much backlash. CUNY was trending on Twitter because they weren't closing. All of the other private schools in New York were closing, but CUNY wasn't. And so there was so much backlash that they posted it to Twitter before they told anybody actually at the schools what was going on. I got up from my desk in history and I was like, well, there's there there it is. Did we do one or two runs of the opera? I don't remember. We did we did one run of the opera that night and it was my turn because Claudia had gone earlier that week or she had like we were we would alternate um, who was running it that night. It was the first time we ever did it with uh, Mark Powell in the room with the conductor in the yes, room. Yes, yes, yes. And that night it was just me running it. And I remember I was like, all right, I'm going to just sing this like it's the last time I'm going to sing it and uh, wound up being true. But <laughs> we'll see. So I think it was the 14th because as you may remember... <laughs> Um, a local community theater group wanted to have a a little uh, get together and performance because there was a show right. going on that that weekend. Right. Uh, but there was also a pandemic going on. Over protest, uh, we had a small gathering. So I think it was the fourteenth was the last like thing that happened even though it probably should have been sooner. For those of you who don't know, uh, Diane here actually had COVID. So, uh, well, we think, okay, your Twitter, is your Twitter bio still Diana had COVID maybe? Uh, no, I changed it. I changed it to just my name. Um, okay. and, and Black Lives Matter. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the reason that it was that is because when she had, um, when she had it, or well, when we all assume that it, that's what it was, testing was so low that you literally couldn't get a test. Like you went to the hospital and they're like, we think you've got it, but yeah. But, so at the time, they were not they weren't giving out COVID tests because the actual the actual uh, RPCR test kits were the stopping point. We had they had enough swabs, so they didn't have enough test kits. The swabs are very uncomfortable. I can say that. Someone said they uh, they feel like they're stabbing your brain, and they do. They definitely do. Your nose goes very far back, and I did not know that. It goes incredibly far back. I went to the hospital. I my discharge papers are somewhere upstairs still because yeah. I'm a hoarder and don't get rid of anything. They. Went 
went in and they said, okay, we can't admit you. You're not bad enough to be admitted. Here's a prescription for uh, steroids for breathing. They did what's called a respiratory virus panel, which is just like a, a bunch of them. It's like five flu viruses, like a bunch of para-influenzas, a bunch of like cold rhinoviruses. Um, and they said, uh, we're not going to test you for... COVID-19 because you're not bad enough to be admitted. You're going to have to live with that. Uh, the discharge papers I have are, you have been diagnosed with a probable COVID infection. So we had spring break. We came back on the 9th and we were told, hey, just so you know, later this week, possibly you won't be allowed back on campus. And mind you, I work at St. John's at the time. I was working as a graduate assistant. So this was a very weird thing where I'm coming from like my internship that I did during like predominantly like the morning, shifting over to my job at St. John's for the afternoon, walking in and like getting all these notifications of essentially everything burning to the ground. Um, because suddenly all these different programming boards and all these things going on were like, okay, what's going on? Like the city seems to be going this way. Schools are saying that. CUNY, there's like a rumor that this is happening. And me personally, I had actually just gotten back from California. And I came home the second or the third. I think maybe two days later, everything was getting shut down in California. And so then once everything started shutting down, it's within the school for me personally, it was okay. I kind of like doing online classes. I have no issue doing that, but what's gonna happen to my job? What's gonna happen to my internship? I'm graduating or I'm supposed to graduate in May. What is that going to look like? How am I supposed to fulfill all my requirements? So it just turn into not a meltdown per se but this whole like domino effect of oh my god what is happening and worst case scenarios going through my brain that wednesday the 11th we were the my campus was shut down we were moving students off campus students were told i think tuesday that they had to like leave they had to be gone go home like move along. Me and everyone in my office was called in for Wednesday and they were like, hey, so you we're going to plan for campus to be open again after, I think we were told Easter. And I think it was maybe a week and a half, not even, that then they made the email decision out saying, no, everything shut down indefinitely. Like, we'll contact you later. There was no word about what was happening with graduation or anything like that. So it was very much this weird stage of limbo. I was student teaching. I was supposed to go to Valley Stream in two right. weeks to start my elementary placement. At first, in the beginning, like in February, um, I was so caught up in like the concert that I was going to be giving with my with my kids or whatever that like. Corona or the COVID virus was not even on my brain at all. You know, mm -hmm. student teaching. When you're in yeah. student teaching, you're in it. You're in it. You're um, trying to survive day to day. Like, student teaching wrecked my body within, like, a couple of weeks. Literally, I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning yep. to be able to get to my placement, find a parking spot, because I was in the Bronx. Yeah. I loved my placement. Shout out to NSLA. But... It was, it was a wreck. It was something that I was getting used to. So I was finally getting into routine. I was finally like setting myself up. It was that Wednesday that y'all were sent home from school, right? And that Friday was like, I didn't know it at the time, was my last day at my placement. In my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to have another week to be at this placement to say goodbye to all of my kids and all of these things. I remember getting that email saying that we had a clear out the building everyone had to clear out Copeland and it's like to make sure that you take things with you because we don't know yeah. when we're going to be able to come back and I remember thinking I didn't know that this past Tuesday was going to be my last seminar class and we were talking about it in our seminar saying we may have to take new rules like new things to incorporate during our seminars but like it was an ongoing thing Karen Smaldone my who was my advisor who she yep. was coming to see me or whatever I remember yeah. that Wednesday she was supposed to come and observe me it was supposed to be my second observation. I was starting to listen to the news and I was like, okay, New Rochelle had a really big epidemic or a, right. uh, uprising in, uh, in, in numbers, right? It was concentrated right. in New Rochelle. My school is about a 20 minute drive mm -hmm. from New Rochelle. So when I found out that, and I knew that Karen Smaldone is, you know, she's the age that she is, I was like, I, I sent, I shot Karen the text really fast. I was like, listen, we can FaceTime. You can watch me. You can observe me in this way. I have an iPad. I was like, I don't want you to come in. And she was like, okay, that's perfect. But again, I'm thinking, okay, my observations are going to be via FaceTime or whatever. And then when things started to close down, I was like, oh my goodness, things are changing. Things are becoming real. All I kept thinking about that day when they closed CUNY is, you know, CUNY doesn't close for anything. 
no, 10 feet of snow. We're still Ten marching feet of through snow. it. Exactly. Right. You, they're like, get your butt on a bus. Yeah. And get your ass <laughs> in here. I found out that we were closing. They, they announced that they were closing the public schools that Sunday. I had gotten a text for my, my CT and he's like, so they closed the schools. I don't know what that means for your field work. And then I got an email later that Monday saying that they were calling all CUNY field work to cease. And that was when it was becoming like more and more real. I was coming out of a lesson with Rose. I got mad confused because like, as soon as I came out, everybody looked at me and was like, you're looking mad confused. You know, normal at the same time. I was like, what's up with the gathering here? And that's when I found out that I, we was going on an instructional recess. I came yeah. out, so like, you, you, did you check social media? I was like, I don't check social media during my lesson. During my lesson, I am causing a lack of oxygen to my brain. I'm not exactly checking Twitter. It was right around the same time for me. It was March 14th mm -hmm. was my last day that I did normal things. Did very normal things. I went to a bridal shower in the afternoon. And that night I went to like a, it was a very small um, party, but it was like a St. Patrick's Day party at my, a coworker's house. Um, so there were about five of us. But that whole week, it, it felt like the world was ending. March 14th was a Saturday. So the previous day, Friday, was my last day in the office. Brought in mimosas and bagels because I was like, it's the end of the world. It's amazing because I didn't know how accurate that statement was at the time. Yeah. Like life really did end as we yeah. know it. That was getting emptier and emptier. A lot more, my colleagues were starting to work from home more and more. So mm -hmm. I feel like we were about to enter some like strange new world. And I started like kind of quarantining March 15th. So that was, like, I started staying home mostly all the time. So yeah, March 14th was like my last yeah. day out in the world, on the subway, mm -hmm. friends. And you took home Ruth Bader Plantberg. And I took home Ruth Bader Plantberg. I did, and then she died. For us, like I work for a public school, and for us that was the uh, March 13th, which was a Friday. I was supposed to teach after school club, and then like it got to the point where it was like canceled at the very last minute. And then that's when everything changed. There's like, okay, come in for you know a week and do training and on how to do Google Classroom. And then from then on out, it was just it was you know no more school. I was at work and I think I was supposed to have a sleepover with Sierra and Christina. They already were told not to come back to school. So I was kind of like sitting there like, I wonder if they're going to do the same thing for us. And I'm at work and literally no one was working that day. Everybody was watching the TV, watching the news, waiting for Trump to like address it and address the nation. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is fucked. I was like, this is all over. <laughs> so I can't remember what the exact day was. It was probably around the, the 13th. I think it was the 13th. So I started counting the days. It was real fun because uh, my mom decided she wanted to move my grandma out of um, the assisted living she was living at. So that whole weekend was spent moving my grandma stuff out of her apartment to here. And it was absolute chaos. Like, it was kind of scary. Like, we would we would go to assisted living and, like, no one would be outside of their rooms. They'd all just be, like, inside and they'd peek their heads out and stuff. And this uh, coronavirus has been making my life difficult since March 13th, so. When did it click for you that the whole thing was serious and that like it was not gonna be just a couple weeks or even just like a month i think even before you know even before march like january february leading into that big you know middle of march date there's a difference between the news you know how like news can catastrophize and it's like oh you know the sky is falling the world is ending sometime around like the valentine's day ish maybe a little bit after it started being like you know this isn't us you know we're not get, trying to get clicks we're not trying to get views here like this is a, this is an issue and after that march 13th date i remember having to pop to the grocery store to get something and then just seeing just massive lines in front of like walgreens and key food and target like these huge like block surrounding lines that's things you don't see like lines out the door we've never lived in a world where like you know we both grew up in well i grew up in new york city you didn't but i mean like we both grew up in america we've never lived in a world where it was like you go to the supermarket and you're not sure if certain things would be there i mean i live in a suburb outside of boston i've never i lived down the street from a girl like we had one grocery store we went for everything and like whatever you need it was definitely going to be there i think during the instructional recess especially when I was home trying to figure things out and all of a sudden the MTA shut down, yeah. that's when it, it like it clicked. Right. It was very gradual for a while. I think originally our office, they said, oh, let's, we're going to be closed for the next month. We're going to be closed through mid-April and then we'll, well, then we'll reevaluate. So I was like, okay, four weeks. Feels like a long time, but I'm sure, you know, it'll, it'll 
go by before we know it. But even that first week working from home, nothing, it all just felt very temporary because I work for a British company. So all my colleagues in the, in the UK were still, a lot of them were still in the office. So I was like, okay, like if they're not all working from home yet, they're the head of the company. Like clearly it's not that serious. But that week they were all issued like a, you all have to work from home policy. Like that became effective for them too. So I was like, wow, okay. Like if now it's the whole company, now it's company wide, everyone's working from home. Like this is a big deal. I had had another shift, another regular shift the next day. Christina was like, Sierra, you're not going to work. You're not going to work. Like I don't care what happens. You're just not going to work. And I'm fighting her. Cause I'm like, you know, I work a number of minimum wage jobs to like do what I have to do. I'm going to work. Like I really don't have a choice here. I was starting to feel some type of way while I was while I was working out and I texted my boss like hey maybe I don't really feel too comfortable but then literally as soon as I do that the news comes out that Broadway is down and that the Met was down you know that's my industry of work stage management any any type of production realm on-call production work that's me so the fact that my entire world literally just shut down I was like all right cool so this is actually not we're not going anywhere (laughs) we're done (laughs) My employment was affected almost instantly after the shutdown. Obviously, I wasn't going to be performing anywhere anytime soon. And even though it would be days or weeks or in one case months before we had the official notice on what was canceled or postponed, the writing was on the wall. And then by extension, I lost a lot of video gigs because if there's no shows, there's nothing to shoot or create promotional materials for. I shifted to teaching online, which was a totally new experience. I'd always assumed that at some point I would teach some lessons via Skype or FaceTime just because for private music teachers, it is a very common thing. My church job was obviously canceled because, you know, no large gatherings of people. Frankly, I'm lucky that I'm still employed at all, even if it is at a greatly reduced capacity. But even still, my income and my finances took a pretty big hit, and it's probably just gonna be like that for a while. I have multiple jobs. I am very much a product of the gig economy. But all of those jobs are in the entertainment industry, which is probably gonna be the last sector of the economy to fully reopen. I feel very fortunate that I work for a company that was able to move to remote working fairly easily. And that was something we knew that we could do until we had to do it. It's been relatively accommodating. And I think companies aren't, I think, very quick to want to allow for flexible working. Mm-hmm. So many companies are, and my company is definitely one of them. I was freelancing for a game development company that develops games for other companies. The source company, the one who paid the company I worked for to make the games, had to lay off people because of everything that was going on. I didn't. I don't think they laid off. I think they furloughed a bunch of people. So they stopped sending money in. Got like a week's notice of like they're they've stopped sending money in. We're not going to have any work for you after next week or something. So it was sudden but I'm gonna be honest the job lasted longer than I thought it would so it was fine (laughs) I was very lucky in that the contract I signed only lasted through March I think and I stayed on until like end of April I was working seasonally and then I was put on brought on staff part-time at a restaurant in Astoria at first it was curbside pickup and then they shut everything down I personally didn't apply for unemployment for personal reasons I just felt like I there were so many other people that needed that money and like Mm. I not for nothing I'm blessed with the fact that I have a roof over my head I have a parent that's working full-time my dad as an essential worker for the MTA. So I was mm-hmm. able to be comfortable. I didn't feel like I should have taken funds away from somebody that I really needed, like people that are paying rent or whatever. They sent us home and they said that we were going to come back that Monday. Obviously we never did. I think what my employer could have done better was communicate with me better because throughout like the two months, like between like March, April, and May, I wasn't getting any like feedback or like, and no one was talking to me about like anything that's going on. And it's a loan company. So there's nothing that they can really do during a virus. I think they should have furloughed everybody to be honest with you i think it was stupid to keep us on payroll because they were just they were like people were working from home but i'm sitting there thinking to myself like that whole time i'm like what what's the point i'm like no one's gonna be buying no one's gonna be buying anything right now like i don't know i think they should have just furloughed everybody because no one got pandemic assistance right like you were still getting paid but because of that 
you couldn't get unemployment. So yeah. I mean, and I'm not complaining. Listen, I'm not complaining. I'm lucky enough to say I got paid, but yeah. the assistance would have been really helpful because I had to pay my car insurance, even though I wasn't going anywhere for three months. I got, it was ridiculous. Like I was paying car insurance. My mom was paying the mortgage. My brother works in the city as a plumber and he got screwed. My boss got laid off. Most of upper management got laid off, which yeah. effectively all the ushers in a sense got laid off. You had like more church jobs than anybody I know. <laughs> Like, you sing at every church in the tri-state. We obviously got canceled for the rest of the year. They were trying to see really? how things were going for, well, for the rest of this season. But the good news is us still being on the payroll, the church's payment protection. Uh... We got one final paycheck of nearly three grand. So that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I see you. Yeah, I'm not working at all. All of my jobs required in-person work and all depended on programming. So with all of their programming being indefinitely suspended, that meant my job was indefinitely suspended. We're just rocking it right now. You're one of actually a few people I know who round up getting jobs during the pandemic. And like, it, it's such a weird thing so I guess like employment wise I was very fortunate in that I was able to continue to work my graduate assistantship throughout like the end of my contract which ended in May I ended up still ended on good terms with my internship site even though I was no longer physically there like I'm still in contact with my supervisor I was very thankful for the relationships I made there even though I wasn't allowed to physically go to the site anymore to be able to still rely on them like professional development wise was fantastic but it was very scary because initially we were told like not to start applying for jobs because God forbid that we didn't meet our degree hours like we were going you have to have the degree in order to be able to get the job and so on and so forth for me it was nerve-wracking because initially because all of it for us like yes you can have all these classes and that's absolutely fantastic but you also need hours for that degree and so it wasn't until like that we were at a certain amount of hours where it was like green lighted for us to start applying for jobs i know like knock on wood like everything i am so fortunate that i was able to find a job but even like going through like the interview process was very nerve-wracking for me in the sense that it was weird to have to do it like in this kind of a format versus like going into an office and seeing a site and like getting to see people in, in person. This might be the last vlog clip before we die but you know what what did you see in the atrium just now? People are fucking drinking Corona like the beer and minutes ago uh, they announced that all skewy, that all, all skewy, skewy, all, all, all cuny and suny are closing. Going to music school online was an experience. It's borderline impossible to take a major that relies on real-time collaboration and make that work through a computer. But for as frustrating as online learning was at times for me, I cannot ignore the fact that I had resources, mainly technology, that made some of this a lot easier for me to ride out. Because of my work, I have video equipment, I have microphones, I have have my own computer, I have a piano in my house. So even though I didn't have access to the music building, I did have the resources that made it possible for me to do a lot of this from home. Honestly, I acknowledge that I am in a place of privilege where I get to be living at home, not having to worry about rent, not having to worry about paying for food every day, having, you know, a physical desktop to be able to sit at a desk to work at my own private space to work in. So in reality, the transition in terms of difficulty was not hard because I could literally roll over and sign on to class, roll over, go to my piano, do whatever assignment that I needed to do. Fine, because I happen to have that. One thing that I definitely lost, which hurt me the most and still hurts, is not being able to have rehearsal. That was a large portion of why I love going to Aaron Copeland. Not being able to do that and knowing that I'm not going to be able to do that for a while is yeah. really sucky. What also hurts as well is knowing that like while I'm okay, there are a lot of people who aren't. So like the people that I care about who possibly aren't, those who I definitely who I have no idea about who aren't. Like all of the kids that were affected by this switch to online, like I can't even imagine what no. their families are going through, what they're feeling because kids are kids and kids are gonna feel things. I would say my education wasn't necessarily affected. Again, like I am so, so, so blessed and like thankful for the counseling department at my school. That department like held it down for us. They were always available for us when it came to like asking questions or finding out more information about like, okay, like this is the, going to be, because they gave us like a COVID internship plan. Like that's literally what it was titled. And it was all laid out in such a brilliant way. The fact that they put that much thought into it and it wasn't just a thing of like, oh, well, guess you 
still have to figure it out was such a blessing. The professors were all super responsive in the fact of being, of saying, listen, we know these are circumstances that are weird. We're going through it too. Like, if you need us, let us know. Like, how can we help you? Like, do you need anything? Is this going on? Or is your family okay? And everyone was so caring. And I think my department's always been like that. But I think given the fact that these were such unique circumstances, it really shined a bright light on that. So I was very fortunate that it didn't affect my education level. I was able to graduate, which I am so, so, so thankful for. It was kind of bittersweet in the sense that I, like you, I went like straight through from undergrad into my grad degree. So for me, this has been a weird time to adjust to not having school anymore. There are so many things that were like being affected all at once. It's like, okay, so can I finish my student teaching? Will I be able to get certified? Can I still submit my TPA? I was super appreciative of the fact that Copeland has these rigid deadlines right? That rigid doctor, everything. <laughs> rigid everything, right? So in this case, I was super appreciative of the fact that we had those deadlines because I was, it was <laughs> by the grace of God that I had finished video recording all of my EdTPA stuff. Right. And, you know, I had finished that weeks ahead and I was just waiting on the t time to be able to do my EdTPA. Like this can't last more than two months. I've rather two weeks. I thought two weeks. I was like, beautiful. I'm taking this time to do my EdTPA. So that's what I did. I sat and I did my FTPA, but then it didn't stop. Our seminar class took a complete total shift. Dr. Yeah. Davis had kind of seen, she saw it as like a wave coming. What I liked that she did was that a lot of the stuff that like assignments that were going to be due that we could have incorporated with our classes, those were no longer due. She shifted to a lot of reflective things, like a reading an article and reflecting on it. And, I, you know, as far as for, for what it is, I feel like that was well done. Did you have like the technological resources that you needed to transition to doing literally everything at home? Personally, yes. Like my district, they have equipment for all the staff to teach from everything like that but my concern was the children the district where i teach it's an area that we weren't going to be sure to have one-to-one -one technology you know all the kids in their houses um so part of that week that we spent getting everything prepared was distributing technology to the children that needed it with regards to work i mostly did we were all on slack anyway because this company has like three full-time employees that i was working for the person who recommended me for the job was also also already working from home and we were just talking on Slack normally. It was not difficult there. I kind of had everything I need just because of the kind of unique situation that I was in. <laughs> some stuff that you were looking forward to that was lost to the lockdown? Ooh, let's see. There's a laundry list. Concerts. So many concerts. Johnny Skeeky, Swan yeah. Jaka, Double Bill. We were about a couple weeks away from tech for our Double Bill school. I had actually gotten an email from someone that I'd worked with, worked with before about a contract that he wanted me to do something at the Whitney. Got another email from another director that I had worked for to be an ASM for actually something that would have really not only boosted my resume, but boosted my level of experience with working with kids. All of our family vacations got canceled. Our annual like end of the year or mid-year concert for school would have got canceled. Was in conversations with my professor about leading sectionals for the master work that we were supposed to do. I was going to be a bridesmaid in my friend's wedding and it was going to be my first time being a bridesmaid, my first time going to the wedding of a close friend. Michelle's graduation, my sister's graduation was canceled. So May was going to be like a really fun, exciting month and it all went to shit. I'm a first year teacher. So that's like, oh, like your first concert, your first whatever, your first performances, stuff like that. The winter concert was only partially mine because like first year teacher, you know, putting it together, we said we're going to keep it really small. So I don't really count that as my first concert. But at the end of the year, my school does a very big involved sort of spring concert. My other art teacher colleague and I were all gearing up like we had so many plans for this and we had it all drawn out we had maps and blueprints and everything laid out of how it was going to be and then you know come March it's like okay so we got to like week three of learning this really cool song for this thing and then I mean the you know pieces can be recycled but you know that's still that experience that you won't get as a first year teacher that was a 
thing that was hard is a lot of those firsts were kind of lost. I guess the thing I was looking forward to most was graduation, just because that's a huge milestone. Um, and getting my master's was like a complete uphill battle. So I was very much looking forward to being able to celebrate that. I had some travel plans, parties, stuff like that. To be honest, I think everything besides graduation, I'm over missing. I'm just like, you know what, like it's fine. Like it is what it is. Just knowing the how hard our city was hit by this whole thing. To me, it feels silly to be sad that, oh, I missed, I missed out on this trip or, oh, I was supposed to go to this party or this wedding or et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't something where just one life was lost lost, you know, it's something that's impacted so many people. I think the only reason I've had such a hard time with graduation is the fact that like I was looking forward to it so much. But I was definitely so fortunate in the fact that like all my friends really made it so special for me and still like helped me celebrate that day. Working in my elementary placement, being able to do elementary general music, being able to enjoy the last months of my undergrad degree at Copeland, being able to socialize with the people that because at the time I wasn't hundred percent I wasn't hundred percent sure that I was coming back from grad school. Being able to do that, walking at graduation. I was the first person in my family to receive a bachelor's degree. And the fact that I wasn't able to walk and have that sense of closure. I mean, they did a virtual graduation, but it's like, it's not, as you, you could probably imagine, it's not the same. But there is hope from some new studies suggesting people who've recovered from the virus do become immune. So we're getting new reports that countries all over the world are having a substantial improvement in their air pollution. What it is proven is that a drug can block this virus. It's a beautiful day out, but it's also a beautiful day for this city. This is a powerful day. Day 100 of the coronavirus crisis, and it is the day that we start to liberate ourselves from this disease the day we move forward. Phase one of the restart begins today in New York City. It's hard to imagine that anything good can come out of this, but there have been some bright spots. I feel like I have gotten closer to every single one of my friends. We've done like the Friday night wine cocktail hour calls. We've done virtual movie nights. The group chats have been lit. I got burned on a video gig. And while that's not good, that's very much not good. That kind of was a catalyst for me deciding to actually sit down and formalize and change how I do business as a videographer for the better. I got to do an online vocal intensive. I got to be on the faculty of two other summer programs where I taught young performers about video, which was really cool. And above all else, I have witnessed just an abundance of kindness from people. And that both inspires me and makes me think that, you know, maybe things won't be so bad when we get to the other side. I have some kids that are just like really into music. I gave them an assignment like, okay, just like, here's this really short song. Just, you know, as an assignment, record yourself before. It. There's this one video of this kid who's just like in his feelings performing it. It's, it's like some like silly little like soul me melody. And he's like, dun, 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 dun. I was like, yes! He was like everything because he was just like so happy. We've learned a lot. We can see clearly a lot more problems that people have known about and have been advocating about for centuries probably, but they are very clear to see at this point. We made an assignment so that our students will create memes. Yes. Students were asked to create memes about music, memes about their professor, at their, their professors, their teachers, and some of the memes that came <laughs> these kids were so funny when michelle's graduation was very up in the air we didn't know what was happening it could happen it could not happen in the minute that they were like okay it's not happening i figured i had to do something really special for her mm -hmm. and heard of lots of friends and families putting together video messages similar situations for graduations and for birthdays and so i decided i would reach out to my close friends and michelle's close friends and our family and i would put together like a huge congratulations video for her did that, but I was like, oh, this isn't enough. I was like, what are we gonna do on her actual graduation day? She's gonna be so sad. Like, I don't want her to just mope around that whole day. So we decided, we, I mean, my parents were like, cool, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> her like a graduation. I really went all out. I made her a fake diploma. I put together like a whole like order of events for the ceremony. I got these huge balloons to hang in my house. So I, I played, you know, and so then I surprised Michelle with this. I was like, we're going to do something on your graduation day, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I like, got up early the morning of, and I decorated our apartment. And then I told her like get dressed and put on her cap and gown. I played processional music. She walked through and then we went through like a whole ceremony and it was so special.